and we're very excited to have a presentation by our steering committee chair, Dr. Barbara Thies, as well as Dr. Walter Gilliam and Dr. Oscar Barbarin, who will be talking about um, expulsion and suspension policies in early childhood settings. Just a quick word before we begin about the technology, we're using GoToWebinar. So if you have questions for the speakers during the presentations or afterward, please use the questions box on your screen to type in questions and send them to the call organizers. And we can then share them with Dr. Fees, who's moderating. And um, after the call, we are recording. We will be sharing the recorded call on SRCD's YouTube channel. And I'll be sharing that information with everyone who attended, as well as our consortium Google group. And now I will turn things over to Dr. Okay, thank you. I hope you can hear me. Um, so I'm, well, I'm glad to welcome you to our All Things Consortium um, uh, webinar today, and particularly to welcome our two speakers, Dr. Gilliam and Barbara. And, um, I just want to provide you with a brief overview of what the consortium is and some of our activities over the past year and our plans for the future. Uh, can you go ahead for the next slide, please? Um, we are a, a national interdisciplinary organization um, of university-based entities. Actually, the members um, include primarily institutes and centers, although we have a couple of individual members. We really want to represent um, university-based groups who are active um, in policy and research and translating research to practice and policy across the country. Um, some of our members' uh, centers are quite small, but some of them actually are relatively large. But I think what really characterizes them is that they are interdisciplinary, um, and you see some of the disciplines there at the bottom of the slide. Next slide, please. Um, and so we're organized uh, to foster uh, research across um, the centers and to bring this research to the consortium so that we highlight through these webinars uh, active research programs across the country. A very big part of our activities is fostering career development um, from the undergraduate, graduate, and faculty so that we can uh, support the next generation of child and family experts um, as they pursue uh, their professional careers. Um, and then we also support engagement um, so that we can translate research and policy and practice um, and identify experts in some key areas that I'll mention in just a minute. Next slide, please. Um, we, had, we began in 2002. Um, and there, uh, primarily, we were housed um, at Georgetown. And in 2008, moved from Georgetown to Duke. Um, at that point, there was a website. We held a pre-SRCD conference. Um, in 2010, uh, interest groups were formed. Um, and we in, uh, enhanced our website. We had a roundtable at APAM. Next slide, please. Um, and really, over the last several years, we have um, grown our webinars. Um, we have established uh, interest groups, particularly uh, in the area of early childhood and child welfare. Um, in 2013, um, there was uh, funding was garnered from WT Grant uh, to support some consortium efforts um, around child welfare. Um, and in 2013, we started the International Child Policy Series with Dr. Joan Lombardi, um, also co-led uh, SRCD pre-conference. And in 2014, we had quite a big move um, to the Society for Research and Child Development um, as our administrative arm. Um, next slide. And currently, um, this is a listing of our steering committee. Uh, the steering committee is an elected body. Um, I'm very happy that we have student reps and early career reps um, because a lot of our activity is to support um, early career um, and student reps as they get into the pipeline. Um, and uh, then we have wonderful support 
um, from staff at the Washington, D.C. office um, of SRCD. I'll say they are part-time, but they've put all their effort um, for full force, um, particularly Sari Lynn Cole and Hannah Klein, um, and then Marty Zaslow is a senior advisor um, for the consortium. Next slide. Um, last year, um, we had some great webinars. Um, we started off just much like we did uh, this year, um, providing an overview of the consortium, and then the child welfare group provided an overview of their work. Um, we had a very exciting series on international perspectives on home visiting led by Dr. Lombardi. Um, and I think an interesting uh, part of that series is that she was able to uh, get assistance from a couple of graduate students at other institutions um, and they uh, received really good experience um, in working with her and this has continued. Um, we also had an a excellent webinar on the biological embedding of child abuse and implications for policy and practice um, with participation uh, from NIH and then scholars at uh, UPenn and Boston College. Um, and you can watch these on SRCD's YouTube channel if you're interested. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we um, also hosted webinars on dissertation funding, um, uh, an overview of non-academic careers, um, and strategies uh, for student engagement on policy. Again, emphasizing um, mentorship and uh, getting uh, graduate students, undergraduate students, and early career folks involved in the consortium. Next slide. So uh, our next uh, webinar is uh, planned for Wednesday, November 4th at 1 o'clock Eastern Time. Um, it's going to be moderated by Dr. Angela Snyder. Uh, the focus is on trauma research and implications for child welfare. Um, and you'll see the list of uh, presenters there. All right, next slide, please. Um, so, as I mentioned before, uh, the consortium encourages participation um, across the spectrum of faculty, research scientists, graduate students, undergraduate students, professional staff, including um, com communications specialists. If anybody at your center has a communications specialist, I encourage them to become involved and their staff um, of member organizations. We're interested in promoting uh, research to practice and, re and practice to policy, um, not only at the federal level, but also at the state level um, and um, administrative policy as well as legislative policy. Okay, next slide, please. Um, I think there are benefits for students um, if your university is a member, then you are a member. Um, you can use these events to identify possible mentors um, who are conducting uh, work that's relevant to you and your, your research. Um, you, there are opportunities to assist with consortium projects. You don't have to be in the same town. Uh, we do a lot of work virtually. And you can connect with students um, and other consortium members, um, either virtually or at conference uh, gatherings that we support. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I think for faculty and research scientists, um, it allows you to connect with other uh, researchers um, across disciplines because we are interdisciplinary. Um, we work uh, very hard on how to effectively communicate your research to policymakers so it's accessible. Um, learn about career opportunities from other members. Um, use a LinkedIn profile um, to support students and other policy relevant uh, tracks. And, uh, just, and also I think one of the things that many people have found helpful is that oftentimes uh, policy relevant work um, at universities is often sort of conducted in a silo. And we often uh, experience different challenges. Um, and being able to share lessons learned in terms of either how your institution, your institute, your center, 
where your working group is organized and how you face some of those challenges um, has been a very beneficial part of being a member of the consortium. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to uh, really call out all of these. I've already mentioned um, some of the accomplishments we've had over the last several years. We co-host um, the Ziegler uh, SRCD pre-conference um, every other year. Last year was a really good one on income inequality and child poverty. Um, we do host uh, member meetups at professional development uh, conferences like SRCD and APAM whenever we can. Uh, we have conducted member surveys to assess their professional interests and research interests. Next slide, please. Um, we have many people in the consortium are interested in issues related to early childhood, and we're going to hear more about that today um, uh, by our speakers. Um, we have increased our membership. Um, we have uh, hosted calls with the National Conference of State Legislatures and National Governors Association. Um, and we have prepared a couple of proposals in response to SRCD's RFP um, in response to the strategic plan. Next side, slide, please. Um, this is a list of our current members. You can also find this um, on our website as well. Next slide. So if you want to get involved, uh, you can join our Google group. Um, you can become a member and contact Sarah Mancall. Uh, her uh, email is right there. Um, and you can become a student intern. Um, and as I said, you don't have to be in Washington. You don't have to be at one of these sites. Uh, this work can be done virtually as well. And I encourage you to visit our website. Okay, next slide. So today, I'm really excited um, to introduce our uh, two speakers. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Walter Gilliam. He's the director of the Ed Ziegler uh, Center in Child Development and Social Policy at Yale, and he's also associate professor of child psychiatry and psychology at Child Studies Center um, at Yale uh, School of Medicine. And I imagine many of you are very familiar uh, work with the work that he's doing on in early childhood education and expulsion. Um, he actually right now is in Washington, D.C. Um, and will have to scoot out right at the end of uh, the presentation today because he's uh, holding a briefing and his work is so important. Um, he has brought to light um, some of the, the serious um, uh, aftermath of what happens uh, with expulsion and suspension in early childhood. His work is highly cited um, in international news outlets, um, including the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, US Today, USA Today, Chicago Tribune, I could go on and on. Um, and he actively provides consultation to state and federal decision makers in the US and other countries, as he's going to do later this morning. Um, our, our second speaker following uh, Dr. Gilliam is Dr. Oscar Barberin. He is uh, currently the chair and uh, professor of African American Studies Department at the University of Maryland at College Park. Um, he was formerly at uh, Tulane University where he held the Douglas J. Hart's Endowed Chair in the Department of Psychology. Um, his research has focused on the social and familial determinants of ethnic and gender achievement gaps beginning in early childhood. And he's developed a universal mental health screening system for children from pre-K to 8th grade. Um, he was a principal investigator of a national study whose focus is on the social, emotional, and academic development of boys of color, and that's where his current work is really going. His work on children of African descent extends to a 20-year longitudinal study of the effects of poverty and violence in child development. He served on the governing council of SRCD uh, from 2007 to 2013. So I think I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Walter Gilliam. Thank you very much. Expulsion is a is a is a not a child behavior. Expulsion is an adult decision, and that adult decision is based on on a variety of things that could include the child's behavior, but 
but also a host of other factors of it that I that I want us to explore, and I'm going to be able to hopefully um, give you some information about as we go through the rest of this presentation. Next slide, please. So in March 2014, the Office of Civil Rights uh, issued a a um, policy brief uh, that was based on they collected. The state of the bay collected uh, was a an accounting of, of the number of children that were being expelled from preschool programs that were located in public schools. And you can see some of the findings there. Black children make up 18% of the preschool enrollment, but 48% of the preschool children suspended more than once. Uh, that's a, a clear over-representation of African-American children among those who are multiply suspended in these programs. And also boys receive more than three out of four of the preschool suspensions. Again, pretty clear over-representation. Um, one of the things that's important to, to note about this is that the data is collected, was collected by, the, by a survey from the Office of Civil Rights within the U.S. Department of Education, and they have collected over the years data having to do with expulsion and suspension practices, but, but only K through 12, and had never collected it for children younger than kindergarten. And it was largely due to, to, to some research that we had conducted in the past, as well as working directly with the Congressional Black Caucus, and in particular, one congressman named uh, Danny Davis uh, from uh, Chicago, Illinois, whose actual office as I'm sitting in right now as I'm, as I'm giving this webinar. It was he that really put pressure, uh, along with members of the Congressional Black Caucus, to start collecting this data uh, so that we could find out what the disparity rates are uh, for African-American children and for boys. Next slide, please. So let's flash back to 2005. Uh, that was when the data were first collected, uh, showing children being expelled from preschool programs. Um, what I could say about this is that we were, we were envisioning a fairly dry study uh, that was looking at, at the way in which state-funded programs were being administered, and, and in specific, what things give rise to better policy adherence. Is it per child spending? Is it where the programs are located? A whole host of other different types of factors. But at the same time that we were getting ready to, to collect this data, I was I was supervising child psychiatry, child psychology, pediatric fellows, on, and on the other side of the mirror, as they were working with young children, children younger than the age of five, we noticed that a lot of them were getting referred to our clinic at Yale because they had been expelled from a preschool program or a child care program and looked at the um, research to try to find out what we could find out about expulsion from early childhood programs and found absolutely nothing in the research. So we basically decided to add a few questions to this large study that we were going to be conducting and see what we could find out. Next slide. So the cliff notes for, for this study was it was um, in 40 states. Those are the 40 states that, that funded state-funded pre-K programs at that time. Ten states didn't fund them. We had a 81% response rate. Uh, we used a computer-assisted telephone interview survey, so we called the teachers up, found out what time was best for us to talk to them, and then administered a 45 to 60-minute survey over the telephone. Uh, with them. We basically took over a, a, a polling call center and then put our staff within there and then conducted the study from there. We offered the teachers $10 and, and the letter of appreciation. There's an interesting backstory behind that. At, at first we were just going to give them the $10 and we had a lot of teachers actually turn us down uh, for the $10 and said that what they would really rather have is a letter of appreciation thanking them for being in the study. Uh, which is just one of those 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 amazing insights that, that one can sometimes get when doing this kind of work that will probably never end up in a, in a research paper, but certainly told me an awful lot about how undervalued many of our preschool teachers feel. Next slide, please. So, what is expulsion? Um, in terms of K through 12, you can take a whole host of different definitions from 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 anything more than three days of can consecutive exclusion from the program to its most common definition. Uh, in 13 states, anything greater than 10 days of consecutive exclusion um, to the fact that the majority of states, 32 of them, have, have absolutely no definition for what an expulsion is and they leave it up to local discretion. However, what we do know is that there is absolutely no data suggesting at K-12 through that, that expelling a child has any impact on that child's behavior. And so if we're thinking about it, well, here's something for us to, to realize. What is the best um, predictor of expulsion? Uh, having been expelled before. 
And so if the idea is that expelling a child is some sort of an intervention, then it certainly is, an it certainly is not an intervention that works very well. Next slide. So what is pre-K expulsion itself? What is expulsion in the preschool years? Well, there's no, there was no formal definition at the time. Um, 18 states claimed to disallow it, but it wasn't really clear as to exactly what disallowing it meant. Uh, 32 states either explicitly allowed expulsion or they passed it down to the local level uh, to decide whether or, not, um, whether or not a child would be expelled and what that would look like and how it would be administered. Next slide, please. So, what was the question that we asked? Uh, basically, we asked teachers in the context of this much larger survey that collected tons of data on just about anything you can possibly imagine about a preschool program. We asked the teachers, over the past 12 months, have you ever required termination from your program because of a child's challenging behavior? Please do not include children that were transitioned directly from your program to a special education program, therapeutic preschool program, or some other more appropriate setting. And so we were basically looking for children who are terminated in terms of their participation um, fully. Uh, this is not uh, expelled for, for 10 days or 20 days, but, 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 but permanently told to never come back to the program. So we were setting a very high bar for, for, for definition of expulsion. Expulsion basically is being full and permanent removal from the program. Basically, the capital punishment of, um, of, of, of any educational program. Next slide, please. So the programs that we were talking about were all state-funded pre-K programs administered by states, serving children in the three to four-year-old range. All had a classroom-based component and all had a stated or implied goal of helping to get children ready for, for school. Next slide. And you can see here on the map uh, where these programs are located. Uh, the ones in, in, in white there without color are the, are the 10 states at the time that have no state-funded pre-K program. Next slide. Most of the programs that we surveyed were located in the public school. There were quite a few of them were in Head Start centers. 29% of them were in Head Start centers of which about half of those Head Start centers were in a public school base setting and half of the Head Start programs were in a non-public school base and about 13% of them were in child care programs of some sort, in either a center-based profit child care program or non-profit agency. Next slide, please. So what were the findings? First, 10% of the preschool teachers reported expelling at least one child in the past year due to a behavior problem. Typically that was only one child, but some teachers reported expelling as many as two children, three children, four children. When we piloted the survey in Massachusetts in child care programs, child care being, being, being a bit different than state-funded pre-K programs, but still the same age, we found one teacher who reported expelling six children out of a class of 16 in the course of 12 months. That's an awful lot of expulsion. When we divided out the numbers of children that were enrolled in these classrooms by the number of children being expelled, we found pre-K expulsion rate of 6.7 expulsions per 1,000 children enrolled. When we then looked at the Office of Civil Rights data that was collected about a year earlier than that for K through 12, we found that the rate K through 12 for expulsion, as defined by different states' definitions, was 2.1 per thousand. So basically, these children in preschool programs, these three and four-year-olds, were being expelled at a rate more than three times that of K through 12. Next slide. However, in child care programs, um, outside of the public schools purview and outside of uh, state departments of education uh, where the child care program is typically much less monitored, uh, the, the rates of expulsion are, are significantly higher. Uh, Detroit, Michigan had a small study that was unpublished, 28 per thousand. Here was our pilot study in Massachusetts where we found a rate of 27 per thousand, 39 percent of the classroom teachers reporting at least one expulsion in the past 12 months. Uh, Massachusetts also conducted, after our data came out, uh, their own study and found that 2% of the teachers reported expelling at least one child. 1% suggested the child leave. We're not sure exactly what that means to suggest that a child leaves, and 1% transferring. So if you do the math on that, that's about 20 to 30% expulsion, which is about what we found. Um, if you look down there at the bottom, uh, one of the interesting ones is in Chicago, Illinois, 42 centers reporting at least one 
expulsion in the past 12 months. Those were all infant toddler centers in Illinois. Uh, so it's, we're, when we're talking about expulsion with three and four year olds, uh, we could just as easily be talking about infants and toddlers as well. Next slide. So if you graph it out, this is basically what expulsion looks like in our in our in our for Uh, so they had no expulsions. Next slide. And of course, when you have findings like this, it, it certainly captures an awful lot of media attention, hit the front page of, a, of an awful lot of um, news sources. But what did not hit the front page was typically any deep understanding of exactly why this is happening um, or exactly to whom this is happening or the context in which this is happening. So I'll, I'll tell you more about, about that in a second. Uh, next slide, please. So who is it that gets expelled? Well, we know this. In mixed age groups where you have three and fours together, the four time, 50 percent more likely than three-year-olds to be expelled. Boys three and a half times as likely as girls. African American children about twice the rate of European American children. Now, when we found the first one, uh, that, that mixed age groups, four-year-olds were more than 50 percent uh, more likely than three-year-olds to be expelled, um, we put together a, a focus group to try to figure out why that would be, because I, I didn't really fully have a good answer for why the four-year-olds were so much more likely than the three-year-olds. And, and the answer that we got back from the teachers was basically this, that it's very different in their classroom to them to have a, a young child who's smaller than most of the other children and has a challenging behavior versus having a child with a challenging behavior that's much larger than many of the other children in the classroom. In other words, it's not just the child's behavior, it's also the size of the child that mattered to the teacher. Basically because the bigger the child, the greater the perceived sense that somebody could get hurt and that the teacher could be held liable. And that was our first clue, that preschool expulsion is not a child behavior, it's an adult decision. And it may be based in part on the behavior of the child, but it may also be based on, in part on a whole host of other factors. Next slide, please. We also know that teacher-child ratio predicts expulsion. As the number of children per adult goes up, the likelihood of an expulsion goes up. Next slide. Same thing for length of day. The longer the day, the greater the chances of an expulsion. Next slide. Teacher job stress. We found that teachers who screened positive for depression on the Center for Epidemiological Studies depression scale were expelling at twice the rate of teachers who screened negative. And job stress seemed to be an even greater predictor. Uh, basically, job stress was or teacher depression was related to job stress, especially when, when adequate supports were not available in the classroom. So uh, depression without adequate supports converts to job stress, and then job stress was a strong predictor of an increased likelihood of a child being expelled. Next slide, please. So within Connecticut, uh, where we were the seventh highest expelling state in the nation, uh, we decided to try to, uh, to do something about that. Next slide. Recently, the, uh, few, well, I guess a few years before, before these findings came out, um, there was a program within Connecticut called the Early Childhood Consultation Partnership. It's a early childhood mental health uh, consultation program that was available to all early care and education programs uh, within the state. Uh, it provides an early childhood it provides an early childhood mental health consultant free of charge into the program to provide coaching to the teacher and to meet with the parent and the teacher and try to work out solutions and then model those solutions to the parent and the teacher. Um, it's relatively brief, it's only three months long, but, but fairly intensive in that time, about six to eight hours per week in the classroom, actually modeling and working with the teacher. Next slide, please. So what we did was we uh, conducted three different studies in, in Connecticut. These were all 
uh, random control trials where we randomly assign to treatment condition versus waitlist control. And you can see here the sample sizes within uh, the preschool studies, which was study one and study two, uh, we identified, or we had the teacher identify the two target children most responsible for, for um, um, causing the, the program to request the service in the first place. And in the infant toddler study, uh, we have the teacher identify the one child that was most likely for, for uh, most, most responsible for the request for the services. Uh, only one child because the, the, the group sizes were so much smaller than the, the preschool samples. In study one, uh, we didn't collect any data on random peers, but in studies two and studies three, study two being with preschoolers and then study three being with infants and toddlers, uh, we also randomly selected uh, one or two additional children in the classroom in order to be able to collect uh, like actually two additional children in each one of the classroom in order to be able to collect data on the potential impacts of providing an early childhood mental health consultation on the children who were not the actual targets of the intervention. Next slide, please. And you can see here a, a sense of what the samples look like, mostly child care programs, but a smattering of other types of programs located, um, far more boys uh, than emails which which matches what we know about about expulsion to next slide and so what we found basically were this here's the treatment group and the control group and as you can see significant decreases um, in, in in oppositionality hyperactivity restlessness and impulsivity overall externalizing behavior problems for the treatment group um, but 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 nothing uh, like that in terms of a significant decrease for the controls. Next slide, please. Study two was a replication, which basically also found the same thing in yet another set of cohorts. And so we were feeling pretty confident that, that the intervention certainly seemed to be having positive impacts within a three-month period of time. Next slide, please. And study three was with infants and toddlers, much smaller sample size, um, and you can see here that we're feeling um, uh, fairly good about the impacts that we saw in terms of family involvement. The treatment group um, teachers rated the parents as being more involved in the program, um, and then also um, great, uh, significant impact on, on the peers' social competence. So this is the social competence as rated by the teachers, including the children, or, or actually just the children, who are actually not the, the, the target of the intervention. One of the things that I'd like to say about the family involvement is this. I've, I've seen a lot of children expelled from preschool programs, and I've heard about a lot of children expelled from preschool programs, but I've never seen or heard of a child expelled from a preschool program where the teacher and the parent knew and liked each other. And so certainly one of the things that we try to do with an early childhood mental health consultation is to try to form a strong relationship between the parent and the teacher as soon as we possibly can, it may not in and of itself fix the problem, but it will certainly buy time for the early childhood mental health consultant to be able to launch a hopefully successful intervention. Next slide, please. Next slide. So in terms of uh, policy recommendations, these are the recommendations that we've been making for the past 10 years, uh, preschool programs shouldn't be expelling children. Um, all pre-K teachers should have regular access to behavioral consultants. One of the things that, 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 that I feel needs to happen when it comes to preschool expulsion is, is this. We, we, have to, we have to both ban the practice or make it extremely complicated to do the practice as well as provide an alternative to the expulsion. Uh, just providing an alternative to the expulsion without a policy against expulsion will probably not be enough. And the reason why is simply because no matter how easy we make the intervention for teachers to access, access, it will never be as easy for them to access as simply kicking the child out of the program. And so there needs to be there needs to be some policy that makes it that makes it much less likely that a teacher is going to be expelling the child in the first place, and then meet the teacher uh, with some interventions that could actually be, be be helpful to the teacher in keeping the child in the classroom. Um, all teacher all classrooms being of a of a reason reasonable teacher-child ratio. Next slide, please. 
Next slide, please. Supportive policies regarding teacher job stress. Um, state and federal funds regarding tracking expulsion um, and implementing and evaluating promising models. One of the things that I'd like to also stay, say here is, is, is this, is that we, we certainly need to have a better understanding through research regarding why it is that boys and African Americans seem to be seem to be a, such a greater risk of expulsion. Um, one of the things I can certainly say regarding regarding African American children is this: when it comes to our preschool programs, there's three different studies that we cite over and over again as the justification for why we fund in the United States programs for preschoolers in the first place. And these are these are because these are the three studies that have cost-benefit analyses that are attached to it and we use them to be able to make the case that, that investing in early care and education is an investment and, 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 and not just something to do to, to feel good. Those studies are the, the, the Perry Preschool Project in, in, in Michigan, Michigan, Abyssidarian Project in North Carolina, and the Chicago Child Parent Centers. We cite those three over and over and over again because they're the only three long-term ones that we have that have this return on investment uh, angle to it because of the only ones that have an economic impact uh, analysis to it. One of the things that a lot of people in the field do not know, however, is this. Perry Preschool Project, 100% African American. Every single one of those children in that study were an African American child. The Abyssidarian Project in North Carolina, 98% African American. The Chicago Child Parents Centers, 93% African American. Basically what we're doing here in the United States is we're taking data that belong to African American children, using it to justify the creation of a preschool program for all of our children, and then when no one is looking, expelling out the back door those children who gave us the data in the first place. And we can no longer do that. And that is why I have decided that I will no longer cite those three studies unless I'm willing to spend an equal amount of time protecting the right of those children who gave us the data in the first place to be able to access the programs that we're purchasing with their data. Last slide, please. And so if you want more information, please do visit our website. And I thank you very kindly for your attention. Thank you very much. That was excellent. Um, I'm now going to turn it over uh, to Dr. Oscar Bargren, um, who's going to make a few comments. Hi, Oscar. We can't hear you. If you can unmute yourself, um, let us know, and, and we'll hopefully hear you soon. I thought that I was unmuted. I'm sorry. We can hear you loud and clear now. Thanks. Okay. So should I start over? Yes, please. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm, I'm going to... Um, provide a, uh, a slightly broader view. Um, and I'd like to begin with um, the notion that suspensions and expulsions represent a breakdown in programs. Um, it is almost inconceivable that a little three-year-old, so threatening, 
and so disruptive that they cannot be managed by, a child, by adults. When we look at uh, this issue, it's clear that it emerges from the frustration of adults um, and the suspension and expulsions represent actually a very easy and quick solution to the problem. My Brother's Keeper initiative and others have argued, along with Professor uh, Gillian, that suspensions and expulsions should be eliminated. Uh, but while this is an easy administrative solution, um, the edict that no child should, will be suspended or expelled does not go far enough uh, because it does not address the full range of problems. There are indeed challenges, uh, for example, that boys of colors face um, and that they present in preschool. They're real. Um, one does not have to go far uh, to see examples of young boys and other children who are disruptive uh, and difficult in classroom settings. Um, in an assessment of early childhood programs uh, using a universal mental health screening, uh, where teachers rated uh, concerns about their ch the children in their classrooms. Uh, we, we learned, for example, in um, a large urban school district in a rural county in Mississippi, a fair, see a fairly similar uh, set of findings. That is, about 20% of boys are described as having at least one serious problem of behavior regulation, attention regulation, or emotion regulation. And 16% are described as having a serious problem with opposition, 12% uh, with inattention. So the problems are fairly widespread in terms of teachers' experience of, of young boys. And these rates are much higher than they are for girls and for uh, those of European descent. So where's the answer, where's the solution to dealing with this if we have to do more than just pass an administrative edict saying no more suspensions, no more expulsions? Well, um, I'm going to, um, in, in finding, an answer, finding answers to these and these types of problems, Robert Whitehurst, a former IES director, famously proclaimed, the plural of case is not data, meaning that simple, simple observations, uh, which are not generalizable and representative, aren't that helpful. I'm going to fly in the face of that and share with you some of the observations that I've made based on one year of experience in uh, a rural county in Mississippi and several years in an urban school district where I spent up to a day a week observing classrooms and trying to figure out what was going on. Why was it that uh, boys of color particularly uh, were ha having such difficulties? Uh, and one of the things that I would say is that uh, as a clinician, as a developmentalist with an ecological inclination, I came away believing that there were at least a tripartite contributions. Part of the contribution to the problem has to do with the setting, with the environment of the early childhood programs. Another has to do with teacher behavior. And so a third has to do with the specific idiosyncrasies of a child. The, in terms of the setting, there are two things that stood out particularly. Um, as a child in Catholic schools, the nuns used to always say, an idle mind is the devil's workshop and idle hands are the devil's tools. Well, in work that we've done, both uh, um, in large studies, such as the NCEDL study of the quality of pre-K um, programs, and some of the observations that I've just described to you, uh, it was clear that children spend too little time in formal instruction and a great deal of time waiting, doing nothing waiting to go to the bathroom, waiting to be fed, waiting to brush their teeth, um, waiting for the teacher to be ready. Uh, and that time, that open time, is right for children to get into mischief, 
uh, to do things that are disruptive and perhaps irritating to teachers. The second aspect of the setting is that teachers are under a great deal of stress. Um, in rural Mississippi, they were often experiencing personal issues. They were uh, paid less than $20,000 a year, and so many were experiencing significant financial difficulties. And so they brought many of these, this much of the strain into the classroom, and there were frequent reports of teachers being so frustrated that they would hit, and that th these programs often had to make reports to Head Start because of, uh, of, uh, of teachers putting their hands on children. And so the level of frustration, I guess the point I want to make is that uh, when we have a child who is identified for expulsion or suspension, it may be as much a function of uh, teacher difficulty or program difficulty as the child. And then the third aspect of the setting is what I would describe as trying to fit a square peg in a round hole or vice versa. Uh, if you think about uh, the kinds of expectations of children, of sitting and waiting, or being still for long periods of time, or being inactive, that this is a difficult uh, set of uh, developmental challenges for many children. And I think the one that's the most, that I saw as the most problematic for boys was uh, the time after uh, the meal, the children were expected to have nap time, that is to settle down, to sit on their, to lie on their couch and to fall asleep. Well, many kids needed it, or perhaps all of them needed it. Uh, many of the boys were not ready and able to do that. So they would end up pulling things down from the shelves. They would end up uh, talking to other kids. They would end up pulling on them. They would end up, so they would end up doing lots of things, getting up out of um, their their sleeping bag. And so. What, what was clear is that we, they were being required to do something that physiologically they were not ready to do. They were not ready to go to sleep. They were not ready to take a nap. And it was difficult for them to settle down. Um, and I found out, you know, as, as, uh, as part of the universal mental health screening and services, I also acted as a consultant. And um, I remember there was one particular case where I was in the classroom with a teacher uh, invited me to try to help her work with this child. And it was a humbling experience, um, trying to sit with the child, calm him down, uh, read to him, um, and then walk away finding out that all of my interventions, all my efforts uh, were to naught. And in some ways, it's the teacher saying, well, if you're so smart, you try and see if you can do what I can't do. And it was clear that I couldn't, but it was, uh, it was a difficult circumstance to begin with. The, another factor that um, I think is important to me is that one of the conclusions of the uh, National Center for Early Development and Learning Early Childhood Study was that public sponsored pre-K programs were high with respect to emotional climate, uh, support, caring, positive teacher-child interactions, but very poor on instructional climate. So this pointed to um, problems uh, that to be solved are centered around curriculum implementation and teacher preparation. What I would argue is that, at least for boys of color, there are few who would argue that, they, um, that it was um, the cognitive sets of issues that were more problematic. And they would argue it was more socio-emotional that needed attention. Well, in the second element, the teacher, uh, it was clear that in my experiences going into classrooms that whether some teachers were very ineffective and some were very effective. Um, unfortunately, the ineffective ones typically outnumbered those who were very effective, or at least uh, they, um, they stood out more. And so the ineffective teachers were easy to describe. They were often disorganized. They were passive. They were self-absorbed. They were inattentive or non-responsive to what was going on between children. They were coercive and often yelled at the kids. However, the effective teachers, interestingly, were not effective in the same way or for the same reasons. And what that led me to believe is that there are really many different ways to be a competent, effective teacher who can manage children. children.
the group. And here I'd like to describe to you three different models that I observe. So the first model, this teacher actually on the face of it seemed quite unremarkable and ordinary on the surface. She was calm, mild-mannered, warm but controlled. She had a more or less passive personality. She wasn't very emotionally expressive. There wasn't much touching of the kids. Um, but you, you somehow had a sense that there was a deep sense of respect and affection between teacher and children. And overall, the classroom seems peaceful and organized. Kids seem engaged and interested. And for me, that was one of the, bit, the most important indicators of the positive environment. The second teacher was quite different. This, this, in this model, this teacher has this big personality. She fills the room with a loud, boisterous voice. Uh, she's in your face, rigid in terms of her belief. She makes up her own minds about things. She's always talking. She's strict, demanding, providing lots of feedback and commentary to kids. She is organized, engaged, and very interesting, gets down on the floor with the kids. She's very personable fun, and the, the classroom is not peaceful, it's very high energy, the kids are boisterous and moving around, but all, all, often always in a very organized way. And then the third model was a low energy, she was uh, uh, quiet, she had quiet control, she didn't move around the classroom much, but the routines were so predictable and practiced that the class practically ran itself. So while the teacher was preoccupied with paperwork, cleaning, or being attentive to a single child, the kids were all doing the things they were supposed to. And they seemed to have a kind of joy in demonstrating knowledge. She used a lot of musical cues to cue kids from, OK, it's time to move from an activity center to another. It's time to move um, from open play to, uh, uh, to center time or it's time to uh, clean up. So it was, so she, in some ways, she, all she had to do was put the music on, and the kids knew what it was time to do. She also used a lot of computer-based learning games, which were effective in teaching kids literacy and math. And so in each of these cases, these were teachers who were competent, though in different ways, who had very few kids that they would describe as unmanageable. The other problem that I've often seen with is that there, some teachers in some settings create, manufacture, or reinforce deviance or pathology and maladjustment in kids. And so the most obvious example in the case of boys of color is a degree of stigma where teachers bring to this setting this belief that boys are bad, boys are difficult, they're unlikable, they're unmanageable, they're like, they, they see these boys like, as though they're men and don't relate to them as well. And often there's a kind of scapegoating. And this was observed in the national study um, where uh, the observers will often see boys of color being the ones who would be sitting uh, in the back of the classroom who would not be allowed to go out and play with the other kids because they were misbehaving. Um, and so in some ways then, um, I guess the most telling example of this was a case where a particular child was identified even by the other ch children as being the, quote, bad child, when in fact the observers saw that that child's behavior was really not much different than the other children. The other example of this was um, how the program manufactures deviance is, for example, in Head Start, there is a hope and expectation and goal that children will eat families like in the meal. And part of what that means is that the children uh, sit down around the table with the plates in front of them, and the teacher serves from a common bowl uh, food and puts it into each of the plates. And the children are expected to wait until they're served. Well, there was a, a very striking case where there was a boy, African-American boy, who had much more difficulty than other kids in terms of waiting. And so the teacher would tell them that you have to wait. But she did something that perhaps inadvertent that really contributed to the difficulty. Instead of serving him last, <coughs> she would often serve him first. And so he was there waiting, looking at the food. And I just noticed that even though she, he was admonished that he shouldn't touch it, after a while it was like the kids with the marshmallow who were told to wait. 
that he had reached out and the teacher would yell at him that he had to wait and she would warn him that uh, he was being bad, he wasn't listening, and would even threaten that she would have to call his mother. Uh, I see this as a creation of different because it could have been avoided by a slight rearrangement or, or ordering. But in the sense, the teacher was planting a seed. This child was being told that he was bad. The final thing is that there are variations among boys. There really are some who, are, who really do have uh, borderline problems with impulsivity, uh, attention issues, who represent significant drains on the um, energies of teachers. And I guess what I would argue is that there, there, there are not many, certainly not as many, as are being expelled but that we have to recognize that they, they exist and that we have to develop approaches to uh, supporting teachers in dealing with them. Uh, and it may be that the problem, I guess in some, in some ways, the teachers were hoping that as a consultant I could come in and change this child to someone who overnight would be self-controlled. Or we're hoping that the things that I uh, advise them in terms of organization and response to the child would in fact change them. But these problems were, were actually characterological or temperamental, biologically driven, and were not going to change over time uh, or easily, in that it was something that the teacher had to learn to manage. And she wasn't, the problem was not going to go away. And so in this case, where the, and, uh, what I saw was the teacher really having to devote a lot of time and attention to children like this. There weren't many of them, but that when you have one in the class, it's like they're very draining, teachers are exhausted. Uh, I think that there are models for supporting teachers uh, to help them with this. And I guess the first place that I would start just in terms of how do we, how do we provide help and support. I would begin with universal behavioral mental health screenings that are integrated into an RTI service delivery model so that there's an early indication of where there are concerns and support is brought in before the teacher gets to the point of frustration. Um, so my sense is that um, in these kinds of universal screening are also useful in identifying teachers who are having difficulty. So if a teacher is identifying four or five or six out of 18 children in her class is having problems, that's also a teacher who may be having difficulty managing the classroom. And that may be a point of intervention as well. The other thing I would add is that uh, supporting teachers sometimes, perhaps by relieving them, by having, when you have a child who really is quite demanding and difficult, being able to uh, have the provide relief for the teacher uh, so that there's either an assistant or a second assistant who comes in and helps with the child, or where the child uh, is accommodated in another classroom uh, for a period of the day. And this was a strategy that I saw used frequently in the Head Start program. The other thing is that we have to recognize that not all children make the transition to the classroom very quickly or very easily. Uh, some have difficulty with boredom and activity, some have trouble sharing, um, and they need something more perhaps than a simple introduction into the typical classroom. In this case, I would be interested in actually testing a model of transitional therapeutic classrooms where there was a temporary assignment to a classroom where we selected a particularly effective teacher, perhaps one of the three types that I described earlier, where there's a smaller number of children, perhaps 12 or fewer, um, and where there are no more than two to three who are pretty challenging. And the purpose of this transitional classroom is to provide a a, a longer onset of orientation to the routines of the classroom setting and socialization by a group of well-mannered, self-regulated kids. Um, I think that this is an idea worthy of consideration along with the universal mental health screening. So I will stop there um, and be open to questions. Thank you very much, Oscar. Those were really um, great observations, and I think you had some really good specific um, recommendations that we can take away. Unfortunately, Dr. Gilliam had to scoot out as he is uh, conducting a hearing on the Hill today.
Um, I think we're going to have to close pretty soon. If I'm looking to see if there are any other questions that we have. Sarah, have there been any other questions coming through at this point? I know some people have to have to leave as we're running out of time. Um, okay. We received a number of questions, but maybe what we can do is we'll forward them to the speakers, and um, and then if you have any follow up, I can send them to everyone who attended today. I send around the notes. Great, great, thank you. Um, so there is a reminder, our next webinar is uh, next Wednesday, November 4th at 1 o'clock Eastern Time um, on Trauma Research and Implications for Child Welfare. Sarah, do you have anything, any other closing comments? Uh, that's really it. I'm going to be sharing the link to the recorded webinar, today's webinar, um, with everyone. Um, also, if you are not already on the consortium Google group, our listserv, please join. Um, I will be sending around a, a link with that. If your institution is not yet a member, please consider because I'll have information on that. And I will also be sending around information on how to register for the November 4th webinar. Great. Thank you all for your attention, and Oscar, thanks very much for your participation today. You're welcome.